Welcome back, everybody. So I was thinking just now, I, I, I've been teaching here for 12 years something. Uh, I can count on one hand the number of times I've, that can, class has been canceled because of snow. I don't, even, I don't know if that under actually has ever actually been canceled. And to have it happen two in a row, that's in March of all things, uh, totally bizarre. So apologies for that, uh, but we're back. So. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I would love to talk about sums of squares for like three more lectures, but I'm not sure that you guys would, under, would be so happy about that. Uh, but I actually think some of the tools we got over the last few lectures uh, are very powerful, and uh, I hope you explore them more. But I want to give you something that um, is maybe immediately actionable on tons of problems. It's a workhorse uh, for roboticists, I would say. Uh, and it builds right off the same ideas, but takes them in a slightly different direction. So today we're going to do trajectory optimization. Right, and the big picture that we've been building up here is, is that the problem of specification is I give you um, x dot of f of x u and somehow ask you to do something interesting with it. And normally the question I ask is in the form of optimizing some objective, let's say an additive form, right? I'd somehow want to find the minimal rules that said and sort of optimize this, maybe subject to some constraints. For instance, I'd like to say, you know, at exit time 32 is at the goal or something like this, right? These are the optimal control formulations we've been thinking about. And um, we've seen a collection of tools that, that work for them. And I want to make sure, more than anything, I mean, this, this class is, is sort of giving you a, a, a toolbox of, of many different computational tools you can throw at these problems. So although I care about you understanding the details of all the algorithms, maybe even more so I care about you understanding the relative merits of the algorithms so that you know when you're faced with a new problem in your research or in, in your life uh, and you need optimal control or something to solve it, then, uh, then you know which set of tools to go to, right? So, um, you know, we talked about dynamic programming and value iteration, which for additive cost functions, it was extremely general in the sense that G didn't have to be convex, it could be, it could have discontinuities, it could, it could be whatever, F didn't, there was no restrictions on F, except that um, because it requires in continuous time discretization, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful solution, but it's limited to low-dimensional systems, right? dimensional state spaces in particular, right? If you can find a way to take whatever problem you're thinking about and project it down into a couple states, it's a fantastic way to sort of brute force the solution. And, and, it's, and even though it's, I say brute force, it's a very elegant way to get that solution. Yeah? Sorry, I just can't read. What's it say after such that, such that x? This was uh, just saying x at time 32 equals x goal. This is a completely arbitrary, you know, one particular constraint you might add. Yep. And I will try to write bigger because I got my little chalk today. So, um, you know, DP and value iterations are limited to low dimensional state spaces. Uh, we talked about Lyapunov methods and then the computational back end for Lyapunov methods. If you're doing it at samples, it becomes, they be, basically you're trying to satisfy inequality constraints instead of equality constraints. So if you're doing it at a bunch of samples, that becomes a linear program or a quadratic program depending on, on how you, you choose your objective, right? And <clears throat> So we used, you know, linear program, quadratic program, but then for samples, and then when we wanted to do for all x, we went to sums of squares optimization. Okay. Now, the big point I tried to make was that going from uh, trying to find the optimal cost to go to trying to find just a Lyapunov function, 
was the difference between trying to find solve a partial differential equation over the state space to just satisfying an inequality constraint at all the points in the state space. And the big thing that that does for me is it dramatically opens up the class of functions that can satisfy these conditions. Right? So the, we saw even in the pendulum swinging up the um, the value function, the cost to go function of the optimal policy uh, had these discontinuities. It was a very complicated shape, right? So you've got to try to find those very complicated shapes in high dimensions, and it's just hard. It's just hard, and it doesn't work that well. The Lyapunov methods say, I could find there's a huge family of possible functions that could satisfy those conditions. So the hope is that you can, you can scale to much higher dimensions by searching over simple functions that satisfy those inequality constraints. And in practice, the types of regions of attraction analysis we did in the previous, um, you know, at the end of the last lecture, which seems like ages ago now, with sums of squares, you know, we've seen those scale up into tens of dimensions, like 10, maybe not tens, you know, but, but you know, between 10 and 20 dimensions, you know, 15, things like this, we've seen examples. A few examples where you do approximations of sums of squares that scale even higher. We did it for Atlas at one point with pinning a few joints, and that was, Atlas has 72 degrees of freedom, um, 72 state variables, 36 degrees of freedom. Um, <clears throat> So that's, I mean, that's that's much, much bigger than what you can do with value iteration. It's restricted, though, more in terms of the complexity of the functions you're looking for. So when the Lyapunov, when you can prove stability of a system with, with something that's a polynomial with a few degree, you know, a few degree uh, low order polynomials, then it works amazingly well in pretty high dimensions. Okay, but it's still somehow restricted. And it's because both of these are trying to solve very hard problems. They're trying to say something about for all x, right? They're trying to say something about global optimality or global stability in, in, at times. So the trick to scaling to much bigger systems and getting rid of this, you know, counting how many states variables you've got in your model, which is a game, you know, that, that's, we're often like, oh, I don't want to put that in my model because that would increase the state, state, state dimension. You know, you can sort of blow that up by changing the question you ask. And that's what we're going to do today with trajectory optimization. We're fundamentally, instead of trying to solve for the optimal policy from all possible initial conditions, we're going to ask for less. And we're going to try to find the optimal control from a single initial condition. Okay, and this is a much more local question now. It's about saying, can I solve this for, for one particular x0? And that is somehow now the difference between finding functions over high dimension, well, state spaces, to just finding a single trajectory. And if that trajectory lives in 10 dimensions, 100 dimensions, that's really not a big deal because it's not about, there's no curse of dimensionality. We're going to fundamentally beat the curse of dimensionality by restricting our search to just a, a trajectory through space. Okay, and that's going to scale very well. But, of course, we're going to give something up by doing that. If you restrict your attention to only a single trajectory through state space, then you're going to, you, it's impossible to know if there's some other part of state space you didn't look at that could have been better. Okay, so we're going to end up with more local optima, local solutions, and things like that. And we'll talk, that's, today we're going to talk about when that happens, when you can avoid it, and things like this. Does that setup sort of make sense? Do people feel like this is, you, you have these sort of slotted into your, uh, into your mind? Okay. Well, let me sort of show you the punchline just to keep you interested. Um, you know, these things can take the problems we've already been thinking about and solve them pretty pretty well. So if I want to, for instance, um, let me see if I can make that a lot bigger. Okay, if I want to just take um, the pendulum and now try to find a, an optimal trajectory that gets me from the bottom to the top. Right? We did that with energy shaping. We did that with value iteration. We're going to do this today with trajectory optimization and just, you know, a couple things to note. It's fast. It solves for a particular trajectory that, you know, is doing the long-term sort of optimization. It's pumping up multiple times. This is in state space, right? This is the center of the eyeball swinging up to the ed end of the homoclinic orbit and, and landing at the, the fixed point, right? And it, it 
basically took as long as it took to load the drawing, right? And that's going to work for other systems too, right? So. Um, I'll show you some more fun ones at the end too. This is the cart pole, and that can you know find a find a set of torques over time. The thing I plotted here, since it's now a four-dimensional state space, is to, but instead I plotted time versus the force on the cart. So this is the optimal you know control over time, which swings up, balances, and drives that to the goal. Okay, and it sort of just works in these cases, but it's fragile. You'll see, you know, it's it's fragile. In fact, I was going to show you the Acrobat too, but we bumped the version of Snopped in, uh, you know, in Drake, like between the last time I compiled and today here, and uh, like, it doesn't happen to find the solution anymore. So, you know, that just pisses me off. Like, not, not, uh, not that we've updated Snopped, that's great. But uh, the fact that there was no reason why this worked, like you could just change something and have a and sort of perfectly different, perfectly good different solver, and it might not work. I sort of got lucky that this worked. And in general, it often works, but there's, there's no, unlike the other, the convex optimizations we do, if I write it down, it's going to work. If you give me a different solver, it's still going to work. If you, you know, change the day of the week, it's still going to work. Uh, and this one is, is I'm taking a chance. I'm hoping that the initial condition I gave it is sort of in, you know, is in the day. Well, I'm going to tell you in more detail, okay? So, <clears throat> I'll stop that. Okay, so so we're gonna we're gonna restrict our solution to finding a single you know the optimal policy from a single initial condition. So let's start thinking about what that what that looks like um, in terms of an optimization problem, and we'll sh I'll show you the code at the end. It's the, the you know the optimization front end is 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 good enough that these problems look very similar, but they are um, they end up with very different computational properties. So let's start with um, you know linear discrete time systems. We should make sure we understand that first. It's sort of the simplest case. Okay, so um, uh, I could have constraints, let's say U is less than or equal to one. I could have state constraints. I could say that I'd like um, x at 32, let's say, to be my goal. If I try to minimize a function like this, I want to minimize um, over u some in discrete time. We're going to have a sum of n equals zero to capital N g x n u n and notice that I've, I've chosen a finite time here where in the past we've often made that infinity for today we're going to often we're going to basically make that finite in every case um, so now let's write an optimization problem to try to find the best use okay so there are many ways to write this down uh, let's let's how about if we do it like this first this is my I think the clearest way is, if I make the decision variables certainly are u0, u1, through u, uh, n minus 1, it turns out u at capital N doesn't, I mean, it depends if it comes in here. I'll say, if I, the way I wrote it like that, I should go all the way to n. Um, so I'm going to ask my optimizer to search over those, for, over those parameters, but I'm also going to ask for it to search over x. Um, I don't need x0 because that's given, but I'll do x1 through xn. Constraints like this are easy to write down on that, right? I can just say u is... Uh, so that's a linear constraint. 
because I could write it like this, right? It's two constraints. So that's two linear constraints. And I can, when it's actually n times two linear constraints, because I'm going to have to write that down for every one of those variables. This, again, is a linear constraint. I could pick out the, you know, some particular time and put a constraint on that if I want it to be at a certain state at a certain time. Or if I wanted to avoid hitting the walls for all times, I could write those things down as linear constraints, for instance. And then now the question becomes, how do I write these in? Okay, well this is a natural thing. I can, given, you know, this is now a linear constraint on these variables, right? Given x1, u1, and xn plus 1, I have a linear constraint here, right? So, so far, so good. I'm still in the land of convex optimization. Now, the game is, what, what are you going to give me for G? I get to, I get to pick G, so, so it's, a, it's my game. And uh, I'm going to pick something that's convex, right? So, for instance, our, if, we, if G is our quadratic regulator, That becomes a quadratic cost that I'm going to add to my decision variable. I'm going to add it to this. I'm going to add it again to this. I'm going to add it again to this. But the sum of quadratics is still a quadratic. So this whole thing put together is a quadratic program. Right? Therefore, it's solvable as a convex optimization. It's also, if I've chosen Q and R to be positive semi-definite, then it's a convex quadratic program, and, it's, and, and I should expect a QB solver to do, do well on this, and it does. Okay. There are other objectives that are, are interesting or possible if I want, you know, using the same kind of tricks, if I were to have chosen G of X, U was, let's say, something about the magnitude of U plus the magnitude of X in, in uh, just the absolute value, literally the absolute value of those, then um, that's an L1 norm. That would be a, give me a linear program. Oftentimes that distinction is not huge, but if you get to really large problems, you might prefer linear programming over quadratic programming, that it will be computationally a little bit better. Okay. So for the special case of linear discrete time systems, it snaps right into the things we've already learned. Linear programming, quadratic programming. And unlike what I just said about the pendulum, this one will solve to optimality, the global opta, and it will it will give me a controller, you know, from U, a control tape, U0, U1, whatever, that goes through time, that is optimal, guaranteed to be optimal for my current initial conditions. Awesome. So what did we gain with this over LQR? We already had LQR was a closed form, simple expression. I didn't have to call a QP solver. I didn't have to call an LP solver. I just, boom, you know, I call LQR and it gives me the solution for all states. There are constraints inside. Yeah. This is the natural generalization of LQR to the constrained optimization. So basically, you know, if you're control, you know, control theorist, you say I've got a linear quadratic regular problem with, you know, I'm calling LQR. As soon as you add constraints, boom, I immediately switch over to now it's a quadratic program. Okay, and people use this in practice in industry. Like this is this is a, people can solve this at you know massive scale, very fast in a control loop. That's the other thing. So this this um, you know this right now is just a is a plan in some sense. It's one trajectory through state space. What if I what if I want a feedback controller? If I somehow if I executing my plan and then um, you know someone comes up and kicks kicks the robot, uh, then I'm in a state that wasn't on my plan. What do you do? Well, these optimizations can be solved so fast that you can actually solve the optimization again at every single time step while you're running. So the version of this, 
if you turn your open loop trajectory optimization into a feedback controller, it's called a model predictive control. MBC, and that's just If you can plan fast enough, and that's a general theme, if you can plan fast enough and consistently enough, then a planner can become a feedback controller. Right? And so even if, you're, if your tool is only giving you trajectories, if you can generate those trajectories on every time step, then uh, you've got a feedback controller. <clears throat> There's some things that are less natural to fit in this. So, um, could you write, for instance, the minimum time problem in this? You just have the cost to be constant, right? There's no reason you couldn't do that. So the question there, so the way we wrote that before is that the cost was one on all steps, but zero at the origin, which is awesome but not convex, right? That function is not convex. Yeah? Yeah, there are micro variables. That's for you, whether you have arrived, constrain the dimension or location. Right. So uh, he says you add slack variables, uh, additional variables to ask whether you've arrived or not. And then what do you do with it? You have not arrived. Isn't we add them up? Have I not arrived? We could have arrived this one. Have arrived at zero. And some of those this time. Good. So, so I mean, there are a couple ways to count time. I think you can do it even without slack variables. But the objective of minimum time is not quite convex. In fact, I think the way people now you make me wonder if there's a, if there is a clever way, but I think the, I think the standard way people do that if they want to solve this would be to put a final constraint saying x32 is at the origin, let's say, and then ask, can I find a solution? Yes or no? Uh, if yes, you can do a line search. Say, okay, well, what about the x thirty? How about x thirty one? All right, that worked out. X thirty two, you know, x thirty, you know, twenty nine, twenty twenty eight. You can just do a line. You can solve these fast enough. You just decrement that and solve the minimum time problem. Okay. Um, and the good thing is that it would be monotonic. It has that strong property that you you just have to do a line search on that. Can you also do a binary search? Yeah, binary search exactly. Yes. Um, right, so, so with a little creativity, and there are courses devoted to the um, gymnastics of finding, finding ways to put your problem into an LP or a QP, and, and you know, how, do you, how do you make that formulation work? And there, those are good, there's a set of skills that are really good to have. But they're not going to solve the more general robot problem for us, unfortunately. It's very easy to come up with, with examples that we care about, uh, pendulum, acrobat, cart pull, but also more interesting systems that for which we just know that there's not going to be a convex reformulation of it. So the next question is, what do we do in the more, in the more general case when I don't have a linear discrete time system? Um, what do I do? Okay, well, let me ask one more question first before I move on with that. So let's say I, want, let's say I had a linear continuous time system. Then, then could I approximate it with this? This is a, see, I had to dis discretize time somehow. I had to choose the dis discrete time system to have a finite set of actions I was choosing from. Okay, so if I, if I made a discrete time approximation of that, this, I can't search over an infinitely complex trajectory U. So we're going to have to think about that in a second again. Uh, you know, how do I make approximations of the trajectory U, but now I'm approximating it over time instead of over state. Okay. Um, So that formulation is one of a handful that you can choose. It's called a direct transcription. A 
approach where you've taken you know the optimization problem and directly transcribed it into the the uh, you know numerical optimization problem. The word direct, actually, all the methods we talk about today are going to have the prefix direct because they are taking the, the you know, problem formulation and putting it into an optimization problem. That is opposed to indirect optimization problems, which look at the optimality conditions of the of the trajectory uh, via something called Pontryagin's min minimum principle, which I think might have gotten lost in the snowstorm. Sadly, I normally talk about Pontryagin, but I think that might be one that that doesn't make it into the lectures. But it's in the notes. Um, there's a, a different set, and nobody uses them anyways. That, uh, they, those are good theoretically, but nobody uses the indirect computational algorithms. So, um, but these are direct. This is a direct transcription method. Okay, where you're just writing it directly, and, and you've made decision variables of x uh, and and n. Okay, there's another version of that. If you're thinking, you know, thinking this seems sort of inefficient, can I get rid of? Can I make this work with less decision variables? That's a question, I guess, for you. Could I have made the same? Could I have still written a convex optimization problem with less decision variables? Right. So I added x as decision variables, but I didn't actually need them because I could solve a way, given any initial, you know, every any set of views, I can figure out what x is going to be by just simulating the system forward. And in fact, x of n, any of these, is still going to be a linear function of the u's that came before it and the initial condition. Okay. So I could write um, a different algorithm called direct shooting would just stick in the solution I know for the decision variables, which is that x at k is going to be um, a of n x of 0 plus you know the, the linear I would do that to myself. I chose k and n exactly opposite, so let me see if I can get this right. Something like that. So since this is still a set of linear equations in U, which would be the result of simulating this forward from x0 under that U, I can actually get, I can solve away those, those decision variables and just write more complicated constraints on U. And that's a shooting method. Okay, so the difference between shooting is the decision variables are only U. And this one has decision variables x and u. Yeah? I think uh, the a multiplying x of 0 should that not be a? Yes, thank you. See, I told you I switched them exactly. Good catch. OK, so um, the difference in in these two formulations in the linear case is not so great. In both cases, they're convex optimizations. Like I said, convex, you know, QP solvers and LP solvers are, are robust solvers that know how to numerically scale your, um, your equations if you give them, and they will, they'll work pretty much just as well in, in each of these cases. The difference gets bigger in the nonlinear case. Um, you know, one of the problems is, so fundamentally, this is a lot of very simple constraints that are all roughly the same, um, the same size, the same numerical conditioning, roughly. You know, A is, so they're exactly the same in this case. A is, is, has the same magnitude throughout for all the constraints. In this case, one of the problems you see numerically is that the control action U at time zero has a relatively major effect on my on my control action towards the end of time, but the control action from you know at time n has a very small effect at time uh, you know n plus one. 
So what happens is that the scaling of the constraints gets very uh, numerically bad, potentially. The QP solvers are robust against it, but the nonlinear solvers are going to start having trouble with it. Okay? So each of these, there's, there's sort of two camps, I guess, of the people who do this or the people who do this, and they all have their, uh, their advocates. But I, I, I normally use uh, direct transcription. If you know, for instance, uh, Emo Todorov, uh, he uses shooting methods, and you know, I don't know if we argue about it, but we, all, we, we every time we talk about it, it's like uh, I'm not going to convince him, and he's not going to convince me. So there you go. All right. So now for nonlinear systems. I'm going to change two things. This is also continuous time, right? So um, if I still have a finite time um, uh, objective, then the simplest thing that sort of matches our mental model from this would be to first do a time discretization using a simple integration scheme. Let's, you know, if I were to do, let's say, Euler integration, I could say that <clears throat> and I can approximate this with the sum, right, of, of dt times um, g of xn. Okay. The same, now all the same things hold, except for the constraint that I'd like to add on my decision variables x is not linear. So I've lost the connection to convex optimization in linear programming, right? This is now a nonlinear constraint. And you still could choose a convex ob objective. I think you know, for the optimizations I showed you there, I still just chose to minimize some quadratic cost to the top. That's fine. But it's really the dynamics that get in there and add these nonlinear constraints. So what is one to do? Right? So the, the broader class of optimization is nonlinear optimization. And often it works incredibly well, but there's no guarantees. Right? So this is the picture that I started to illustrate before, right? where now I have some decision variables. Let's, you know, use 31 or something, and I look at the, the cost j of x zero. What happens is somehow fundamentally my, my cost function could be doing more complicated things. It's not a convex function, right? And so in practice, one of my numerical solvers trying to find solutions, it might get stuck here, it might get stuck here, it might get stuck here. Only one of them, I made them all look pretty good, but some of them might be suboptimal. If I have constraints, like in the um, swing up problem, I said the final time should be, the, the robot should be at the goal, then what do constraints look like in here? That's, there's some, some parts that are, you know, that are just constrained. I'm not allowed to be here. I'm not allowed to be here, for instance. You know, there's some, some parts of state space that are, or, or decision variable space that I'm not allowed to be in. And these constraints also cause local solutions to happen, right? So my solver might be started here, start happily going down the hill, but then get stuck on the edge of this constraint and not know where to look, okay? So in practice, if I have a good initial guess and my solver does a good job of going down, then great things can happen. I can solve very complex problems. But if someone changes the version of your solver on you and you ended up over here for some reason, then you're here and it's lecture time and you're like, okay, I guess I'm just going to show the carpool, right? <laughs> so 
it can happen, right? That's what happens. Huh? Um, and it's really, really annoying to not have the, so, you know, there's, there's a bigger discussion here, I guess, about, you know, I think a lot of the, uh, the approximate approaches to, that people use for control, there's so much sort of hacking in the back end or whatever, and it depends on your, your patience for these kind of things. But um, it's not just about being sort of theoretically pure. It's, it, as it's when you're programming these very complex systems, if, if something doesn't work, you, you want to have theorems that tell you it should work, or you, or, or or you know things that you can check to go and go in and look to see is it satisfying this or do I have a bug, right? If it, if my Lyapunov function is not going downhill, I can find that out and I can figure out that there's a bug and I can go do it. If I'm solving it, if I'm handing it to a solver and the solver says it, and there's no reason why it should say yes or no, then it's extremely hard and frustrating to debug, and it's very hard to deploy. So in practice. Um, for instance, during the DARPA challenge, okay, uh, you know, we had optimizations that could make Atlas run. We had optimizations that would make it jump off, a, you know, off a brick and do these, you know, kind of pretty dynamic tasks. Uh, during the DARPA challenge, we walked like this, right? Because uh, we, did, we did a lot of, of, of optimization and planning, or whatever, but we restricted all of the things we were willing to do on that robot when it was a, you know, everybody was watching and we had two chances and to, to make it work. We couldn't afford to fail. I can't take the chance of, you know, I'm running along and then suddenly my solver says, infeasible. Like, what do you do? You got a 400 pound humanoid, you know, moving at high speed and your solver just got confused. You don't, you know, so, so in practice, I mean, that was, that was defining for me. Uh, you know, I had spent a lot of time working on nonlinear optimization type things and the value went way down when I realized I couldn't actually field them on game day with any confidence. So, you know, in my work, that, that led me to be more conservative with my algorithms. So in manipulation, it's less bleak, right? So if I sit there and I say, find a plan, uh, and it says, sorry, I didn't find a plan, you know, you don't fall down or smash a 400 pound humanoid into the wall. Um, but in, in more dynamic tasks, uh, I think you'd like stronger guarantees, right? The, the sample-based planning has the same pitfalls. Sometimes it just goes away and doesn't give you an answer. And then what do you do? Uh, so we'll embrace the virtues here and, uh, and uh, you know, talk about the times it does work because it does actually work very well. And in practice, now that I've said the negative thing, let me say the positive thing. These formulations that we're going to dig into a little bit more now, um, you know, in the past, I've watched people do projects on lots of different topics and lots of different classes. There are lots of different, you know, uh, the final projects during lots of different semesters. People have made trajectory optimization work, you know, just using the tools that we give you and with a little bit of tweaks. People pick up the craziest systems and make trajectory optimization work. It's a really, um, it requires a little bit of, of playing with it. You know, you might have to find an initial condition or, or tweak your cost function or something like that. But with a little bit of, of parameter tuning, you can make this, make robots do brachiation, you know, you're gonna do a move on the monkey bars or throw themselves, you know, sideways or whatever. And, you know, I've seen cool, cool things come out of the class projects using trajectory optimization uh, that made it, you know, really compelling that it can work. I just won't put it in my 400 pound humanoid. Okay, so how do we, how do the, um, how do the nonlinear solvers uh, solve a problem of this form? If I give it something that is, uh, you know, let's say like, like this, um, it's got a nonlinear constraint or nonlinear dynamics, how do the solvers solve it? So the picture I've given you here suggests you can take an initial condition and start going downhill by just looking at the gradients of the cost function and, and staying inside the constraints, and that does work. I mean, this is an equality constraint, so the picture's a little different, but in practice, you can do gradient descent and project yourself onto the constraint manifold and try to go downhill. Okay, the solvers that, we, that um, come with, with Drake that we use most heavily are, uh, the one we use most heavily for these kind of problems is SNOPT, which is a sparse nonlinear optimization. It does something different. It does sequential quadratic programming. So the idea with sequential quadratic programming is that gradient descent can be slow and can get stuck in small local minima. A faster way to go down the, the hill is to wherever you are right now, make a local quadratic approximation of the function 
a local linear function of uh, approximation of the constraints. And then in one step, you jump down to, to what would be a new optimal for the QP. Okay, and then you find yourself here, you make a new quadratic approximation, and in practice these things converge, these are second order methods, they take a second order um, gradient of the, of the function, and they have second order convergence, they will converge faster to the, to the minima. In practice they also hop over spurious local minima that gradient descent can get stuck in. So sequential quadratic programming is a... Uh, is a powerful tool for this, and the solver we use is Snopt. We also support IPOPT and a couple others, but Snopt is the most performant in my case, in my exam, uh, experience. Okay, so um, this was sort of a gross approximation of the continuous dynamics, just as a, uh, this is like the simplest linearization you could do. If you've ever been in the game of, of numerical integration, you know that this is an Euler integration. This is a first order approximation. This is a there are better ways to do that numerical integration. Um, in practice, in these formulations, I don't actually even need to solve the equations forward in time. I can solve them, I can have a-causal integrators, I can do backwards Euler integration, I can do runga kutta methods, I'm just throwing these out in case you know them, you don't need to, to know them, but know that any of your sort of standard numerical integration tools can be put in here. Many of them have the property of, uh, you know, well, some of them are smart in the sense that they require less evaluations of f if f is expensive, if you have to compute the dynamics of your humanoid or something. Okay. All of them will fall into this nonlinear uh, constraint formulation and, uh, you know, could be solved with SQP. But there's a very clever thing that you can do that you can't do in numerical integration, um, which is a, sort of an important trick. People feel like they know what I'm talking about when I say Runga Kata and ODE, uh, these different ODE solvers. Some people, some people know. Like the trick, I don't know if you know, you know, so the, the, the reason the ODE 4-5 is a thing, Runga Kata fourth order, f f f you know, fourth order with fifth order error checking is a thing, is because it's this magical place where you can evaluate the function f only five times or whatever and get two independent updates that are one is fourth order and one is fifth order and they can do error checking. It's like it just, it's a, it's just, you know, you write out the, the fourth and fifth order approximations of the integral and they just happen to line up in a nice way but somehow give good performance. Um, the same sort of tricks happen here. So there's going to be a, a one particular choice of integration scheme that will give a third order accuracy for very, uh, very efficiently for these numerical optimization and that's called direct collocation. Okay. I guess I should say. Okay, and the idea, the magic place for direct collocation is when you, you assume that u of t, I have to come up with a finite parameterization of it. In that case, I just chose u to be basically a zero order hold. But in this case, I have u of t as my decision variables are still u at time zero, u at time one, let's say, u at time two, I'm going to say my approximation of u in the continuous formulation is as if it's a first order hold. So
Okay, so linear interpolation between the different decision variables. But I'm going to evaluate, if I wanted to evaluate my solution between the um, decision variables that I've computed, I'm going to interpolate them linearly. Okay? And then I'm going to say x of t is a cubic spline interpolation between my decision variables. So I have decision variables for x0, for x1, x2. I'm going to make a cubic spline approximation. It turns out in um, in this formulation, if you choose, if you make those two decisions, then there's a nice trick, which is that you can write your constraints without any numerical integration explicitly. You, you say that at for each for each interval. following things to hold. You'd like to say that um, x dot at t1 equals f of x1, or x at t1, u of t1, x dot of t2, x at t2, u of t2. So the derivatives match at the endpoints. And then you put in one more constraint. This is TC, T co-location. Which in practice is the midpoint in this case. T point, yes. Um, <clears throat> so what you say is that when I look at my spline that comes out here, I'd like that if I evaluate the derivatives there, the, the gradient of this spline, which since it's a cubic spline, you can take the gradients and they're simple functions of, in the case of a cubic spline, the gradient at this point is a simple function of the, of the, the knot points. The gradient at this point is a simple function of the knot points. And you'd like to say that your dynamics are consistent there. And then the other place that magically becomes, if u is a, um, a linear interpolation and this is cubic, then you can also very efficiently take the gradient at the midpoint as a simple function of the decision variables. And you say that that should have the same slope as my dynamics predict. And then by just enforcing that, you don't actually write an equation x2 is some function of x whatever. You just say, I'm going to find, search over splines such that the gradient is correct here, the gradient is correct here, the gradient is correct here, and so on. That results when it converges in a solution that is as if you had integrated it numerically to, to third order. Okay? So it's a trick called direct co-location. It's just sort of the best, in, well, it's the sort of, in the same way ODE 4.5 is the best. It's this, it happens to be a very convenient way to get, uh, you know, faithful dynamics with sparse settings of your decision variables. The complexity of your optimization problem, now it does not grow in terms of the dimension of the state variables as many as much as it grows in the number of time samples you have to, to, to add. So if you can take bigger time steps, you get a better, a smaller optimization problem, and this is the one that gives you the most bang for your buck. Direct co-location. Yeah. Russ, I was thinking about it, there's that good question about like the limits of um, uh, trajectory optimization, and in, I was thinking about sharing about it a little bit. In particular, it's in situations where you worry about having an online solution, and I think like a good practical way to uh, get around that is a much primitive type approach where you can spend lots of time offline doing trajectory optimization for very complicated systems, but then you boil it down to some discrete set, and then you just on online evaluate and make stuff online. It's not the easiest for Atlas super complicated, but for things like cooperators navigating in an environment, that's a very good approach. Yeah, we're gonna we're, we'll that'll be part of the story. We'll come around in a couple lectures. That's a super good point. So in a lot of cases, you can pre-compute families of trajectories offline. I'm just repeating it for for those that couldn't have heard you because of the audio here. But in um, 
uh, yeah, in many cases, you can design, you can solve enough of these offline where you, it's okay if you fail occasionally, but you can solve enough of these on, offline that you could use a, sort of a library of trajectories online. And that happens, yeah, Pete's work uses that, for instance, and we have, a, we have a lot of examples of actually using that on real robots, where you've pre-computed some family of possible actions that you could take, and then at runtime, you just check to see if those actions would have been good. So for instance, in Pete's work, he's got a family, he's got a quadrotor flying at high speeds through forests, and he's got a family of possible, I could, I could bank to the left, I could bank to the right, I could go up, I can go down, whatever. And there's a small enough family of those, and then when you're at runtime, suddenly trees are appearing and, and uh, there's obstacles, but you can quickly check to see if any of those trajectories would smash into a tree or not, and pick the one that's your favorite that doesn't smash into a tree. Yeah? Is that an obvious about discrete actions? That's a way, it's a smart way to make discrete actions that are sort of, one action is a trajectory for the next 10 seconds, let's say. Mm -hmm. So discrete sampling of continuous So direct collocation is the main tool that, that um, we'll use in the, that I just showed you in those examples, okay? Does that sort of make sense? It's, it's interesting to say that, that you know, as long as my derivatives are, are, the same, are, are consistent and that I, my function is in a simple class, uh, that it will converge on the correct numerical integration solution. That's a, sort of a, a fun trick. All right, so let's think about where the local minima really get you. Um, you know, the kind of problems that, that where this can, can do badly, okay? So, uh, for instance, in Pete's problem, if you've got an airplane or a quad rotor that's flying through a forest, right, and, uh, you know, from top-down view, I'm going here, and Pete's got libraries of trajectories. But if, let's say I didn't have libraries of trajectories. I'm just solving for a, a trajectory optimization that's trying to get to the goal, okay? And... Let's say there's a tree here. If my optimizer is currently looking like this and trying to get there in, two, in three seconds, it's possible, it's impossible that it just can't get there this way. And what it really needed to do was sort of look at a very different solution going around the other way around the tree. Okay? That's exactly the picture of being on the wrong side of this constraint and, and the solver having a hard time jumping to the other side of the constraint. Okay, so that's sort of a very physical local minima that you can get stuck in in the solvers, right? It's just, try, it's trying here, it's trying here. No amount of gradient information is going to tell me stop and go try over here, okay? But there's, there's more subtle things too. So imagine the, the pendulum um, example. In this case, uh, SNOP is smart enough to, to, to make it jump over some local minima, but you can imagine if I'm currently examining a trajectory that it uses two pumps and gets almost to the top, right? But the torque limits, it's just not, you just can't quite get there, you know, two pumps. And the real solution is having to pump three times, right, to get to the top. It's very hard, that's a local minima too, right? Because it's very hard to decide I've got to do worse for a while, going to three pumps, in order to ultimately go around and get to the top again, right? So that two pump versus three pump are, are, are almost like this, but they're in dynamic space, yeah? Okay, so... <clears throat> Does trajectory optimization, I, I'm, I'm doing the slightly shorter version of it, but is, does trajectory optimization sort of make sense? The big idea is that you're looking at single solutions of the dynamical system instead of for every solution, for every X. You're looking at for a particular initial condition. That's how you break the curse of dimensionality. The thing you gain is high dimensions. The thing you lose is completeness of knowing that you found the right solution because you haven't looked everywhere and you're giving up on looking everywhere. Okay, so um, if I, let's say I've, I've been able to plan a trajectory like this. I still, uh, I need something to do to, to optimize it now, or to, to run it on the, on the real robot. We already said one idea. If you can plan fast enough, you can do model predictive control. And I, I execute my plan from here. I, I do my planning from here. And then on one step, maybe the wind is blowing, so my, my plane's over here. I'm going to plan again, okay? People do that all the time with the the convex trajectory optimization, the, the uh, LPQP. It's less common to do it with SQP for the nonlinear optimization because 
you're, you're, you're taking your chance more, right? You, the solver could give you a very different answer here, right? So if it's, it's, it's sort of a nightmare to think if, that I, I, it told me this, and then now suddenly it tells me this, and then okay, in the next step it tells me this again, and uh, thing, you don't have any guarantees. People do use it, and they, you know, there are car makers out there that, that put it on cars, and there's, you know, there's, there's, there's places where it works pretty well, but you have to put band-aids and wrappers around it to make sure that it, um, it doesn't do anything wrong, okay? Um, so there's a different approach, which is taking this trajectory and then let's not call trajectory optimization anymore. Let's just figure out if we can locally stabilize the trajectory. Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, the, what are my concern is if, you're, if you have something like wind, that would make your F wrong. And yeah. If your F is wrong, then this is like pretty much garbage. So that's exact. So um, if we can plan again, so f I mean feedback more than anything is about you know it's, comp it's compensating for disturbances. It also compensates for model error, right? Oh, wait, so, would you, so you would update your model and then update your F and then the, the trajectory. Even if F is wrong, if I don't update F, but I give a controller that would be stable for this F, then there's hope that it could be uh, it could work well still for the uncertain system. Okay, that's the the argument there is something like if I depending on how f is wrong, this goes back to the pictures I was showing of the cubic polynomial where if, if some of them move the fixed point and some of them just change the region of attraction. So there's a lot of subtle things. We'll talk about that in the robust control part of of the course. But at a high level, philosophically, if I stable if if this controller is stable under this known dynamics, then I might hope for success even if the dynamics are a little bit different than what I expected. Okay. So if I were to just take that trajectory and try to stabilize it, we actually already have a good tool for doing that. It turns out LQR can also be used to stabilize a trajectory. Okay? So um, So if I have this and I have an initial trajectory x0 or nominal trajectory u0, then if I take a, f you have to think for a second what it means to take an expansion of this thing around the trajectory. Right, so I, I told it, it was natural to take a linearization or a first order Taylor expansion around a point. What does it mean to take it around a trajectory? Well, I could still take the gradients of this. I could say that this thing is um, f of x. This, the time derivative here at t is is approximately equal to the first order Taylor expansion. All of this math still holds, but now I'm going to take this gradient around, depending, it's going to be a time varying gradient, I'm going to take it around whatever my current, uh, whatever the, the time is right now, okay, and that'll give me x minus x0 of t as my approximation, plus partial f partial u, again at x0 of t, u0 of t, u minus u0 of t. If I call this x0 of dot of t, then exactly the same tools I did before, if I said x bar is x minus x0 of t, and u bar of t is u minus u0 of t, that these equations come back down to being x bar of t is a of t 
x bar plus b of t u bar. Yeah? In the derivative, to estimate uh, mirrorless dynamics, do we really mean time, or are we interested in some notion of progress along the direction? That is such a good question. So the question was, um, do we really care about time, or do we care about progress around trajectory? Um, I care about progress along the trajectory, but this works for time. And it's a, it's a limitation of this. So if I, um, so what does that mean? So if, I, if I'm going to stabilize in this way, if my plane is proceeding and I'm executing this stabilizing controller, if I'm moving along here and then a gust of wind pushes me this way, I'm actually going to try to get back to here because I'm stabilizing this thing that's a function clocked on time. Okay, and uh, that's that's bad. It gets worse in um, uh, when you're stabilizing limit cycles, like we'll do for walking robots, because uh, the limit cycles really should have no dependence in time. They're, they, yeah. uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, and I will also tell you this, the upgrade to this that can work. Basically, you try to not stabilize the dimension along the, the axis using a, a different coordinate system. But for today, we're going to stabilize time. Yeah, that's a really good question. So if I'm linearizing around a moving point, I, I can still linearize, and if the moving point if the, if the moving point is dynamically consistent, then I still get a form that's linear. It's, the only thing that's different from before is I have A and B are now time varying. Okay. Now, if I take my LQR problem and I somehow ask the question, what's the optimal controller for this? Finite time, G of, let's just write the quadratic form here. These are bars, but I'm, I'm just, I'm not writing it for any linear system, but in practice to go from here to here, you'd use the, the linearization along in the, the error coordinates there. Okay. It turns out that this has a solution too, and the Riccati equation still gives it to you. You have to. You can't call a function in MATLAB or or PyDrake uh, to get. Well, in PyDrake you can actually, but in uh, in, in MATLAB you can't uh, because that was not my intention. Uh, you know, I wasn't trying to slam MATLAB or something. But um, you have to do more work to get this because it's not a closed form solution. The solution is um, it takes this form. So it turns out that the optimal cost to go. J of x bar, um, which depends on time now, has the function x bar s of t x bar. Okay, it's still a quadratic form, but the quadratic form varies in time, and. The way I've written it so far here, what we can say about it is the Riccati equation is now um, the conditions that, that describe this, which guarantee optimality, right from the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, tell me that something about how the rate of change of that, right? So the, the rate of change of this function s of t is my, now it's, it's now my differential Riccati equation. I'm going to leave off the T's just so I fit on the board here. This is what the Hamilton-Jacobi equation tells me about that, the derivations in the notes. And the other thing I know is that the, co the final at time capital T, the cost to go is zero because I have no final cost in this formulation. So magically, LQR was the, was the stationary solution of this. When this was equal to zero, that was just the Riccati equation. And we called the numerical algorithm that was specialized that to solve for s, which set this equation to zero. The slight generalization of that is to have a differential Riccati equation. And you integrate the solution backwards in time from the end to 
um, solving this. And you can integrate this just like you integrate any different differential equation. So this is a matrix differential equation. And you can solve it with a numer any numerical algorithm. And we package that up into something called time varying LQR. And in practice, this is a recipe that works really, really well. Is you, um, you know, if you're if you're a robot um, that's about to move, you make a plan, you solve the LQR controller, and you start executing. And I thought it would be fun. I was I've been watching the, the time here. I thought it'd be fun to sort of give you this the story about the version, you know, the set of experiments that convinced me of how powerful this was. Okay, so the, the thing that convinced me that this was really, really a powerful set of tools was this experiment, set of experiments we did a handful of years ago about trying to make an airplane land on approach like a bird. So if you go into my lab, you'll see sort of a, um, a history of, of robotic birds that we were playing with a number of years ago. We had one of the first ever autonomous birds. It was two meters long. It carried a Lennox box in its belly, which at the time was big, heavy things. Uh, there were no Raspberry Pis. We were carrying PC-104 bricks. Um, so that's why we had a, a two meter wingspan and we were flying around campus. And we started asking, what would a robotic bird do that, a, that an airplane couldn't? And we said, well, air, you know, airplanes don't land on a perch. Uh, uh, so we'll make our birds do that. And we thought, wait, this is, maybe airplanes can land on a perch. What, what, why do they not land on a perch? And we started a series of experiments uh, understanding the complexity of, of landing a, an airplane on a perch, which in our case was a piece of string that we ran across the lab. Um, <clears throat> And by the end, we understood that we could do it. You actually didn't even need a complicated airplane. The simplest airplane we could ever make land on a perch was a foam glider with a single control, which just controlled the elevator. But it didn't have ailerons. It didn't have anything like this. Um, so let me tell you that story real quick here. So it's a very nonlinear system because when you, when a, when the reason that airplanes don't normally land on a perch is because Okay, maybe because the wings would pop off. But for smaller airplanes, there's no excuse, um, right? It's, it's, you know, birds do it all the time. And what they do that's special is, so, so airplanes normally stay in a low angle of attack relative to the oncoming flow, right? Because what happens is, is that, you know, when you're at a modest angle of attack compared to your forward direction, the air just moves around and you have a fairly linear um, understanding of the change in the lift and drag forces as a function of your angle. Okay, but there's a catastrophic thing that happens when you stall your wings, right? Well, basically, you know, intuitively, the momentum in the air, you the air does not bend around the wing fast enough. It separates from the back of the wing, and you start shedding vortices, right? You, these, these things start kicking off and rolling backwards. And this is just a very nonlinear function of the angle of attack, and it's dynamic. So your pitch rate affects the dynamics of this considerably, too. So, you know, if you could just solve nonlinear under actuated control, then you can make a land, bird land on a uh, airplane land on a perch. And that's what we tried to do, okay? So, uh, why would you want to do this? It's kind of fun, actually. So, um, we did some analysis of, you know, birds and planes. And so, if you took a, um, you try to, to, to make a fair comparison, so you scale out uh, mass, effects, wing area, the density of the fluid, which is a, they're all in air, so that's okay. And you try to make some statement about um, how well a bird could land on approach compared to an airplane. We came up with the, the fair metric to compare against different scales is the distance averaged drag coefficient. Okay, so if you just look over the course of a maneuver, what's the average drag? That turns out to be the dimensional analysis that's sort of consistent and rules out these effects. Here's a few approximate reference points, okay? So a 747 uh, landing at, at Logan, let's say, typically gets an average drag coefficient of about 0.16. Okay. Um, there are planes that they're super maneuverable. The X-31 does this sort of very high angle of attack short run to, uh, one runway landing. There's also, this one's actually called the super short runway landing. Um, but they're sitting on a huge thruster. They're basically tail sitting on a massive uh, thrust vectoring engine, okay, to do that. And when they do it, they get a drag coefficient of about 0.3, so they can stop faster, you know, considerably faster than the, 
than the 747. Um, what kind of dread coefficient do you think you get from a pigeon? The funny thing is, I, I really wanted numbers from like a hawk or uh, you know like a, a, a some sort of really agile bird. But my friends at Harvard worked on pigeons, so uh, <laughs> and they convinced me that these are actually really they're really good. Uh, you know, so when you see them like fly down and steal your lunch and then fly back away or whatever, that they're actually the urban dwellers that are very agile compared to a lot of the sort of um, forest flight. Okay, so the common pigeon gets a uh, 10, right? So I think we calculated that if, if a 747 wanted to get a 10, that would mean going from its 450 mile an hour cruise speed to roughly zero in about 100 meters, right? And I admit that the wings would pop off because there would be structural issues. Um, but at the smaller scales, you know, the forces are, uh, obviously the birds can do it. So we built a series of planes and tried to knock it down to the simplest possible. And this was the simplest possible. So foam plane, it also helped to be simple because we crashed a lot, right? So and we had to rebuild them constantly. Um, and so flat plate glider, off-board sensing and control. It was flying, and this is one of the first uh, sort of motion capture experiments back before that was cool. Um, and then we did a lot of work to do system identification to find the, the nonlinear function f that went up and through the post-stall aerodynamics, OK? Um, and it turns out the textbook theory of flat plate theory, so this is almost a flat plate, although it's not perfectly flat and it's got you know, leading edge artifacts and things like this, but the textbook theory played out in our data surprisingly well. Okay, so uh, this is the lift coefficient as a function of angle of attack. Now, the first thing you should notice, if you're an aircraft designer, um, you know, most people plot it down here. Like this goes all the way to 140, which is the airplane you know, backwards and upside down, right? So, um, and we, that's real data, you know, we, you know we, we shot that plane a lot, Rick mostly shot that plane a lot of times to get that data in motion capture, and it's amazingly good. We actually thought we were going to need much harder, more, more, more complicated models, but, but that's actually surprisingly good. The drag coefficient looks a little bit more messy, but th that turns out to not be messy. That's actually the vortex shedding. So if you looked at this as a, at any one trajectory, you'd see oscillations here. And in fact, we built a series of experiments to confirm that the oscillations in the drag coefficient, which we picked up from motion capture, awesome. Like the acceleration differentiated twice was clean enough that we could see the vortices pulling off the back of that plane. And then we did a series of experiments that uh, I'll show you in a second here of counting the vortices and verifying that that's actually what it was. So in 832 language, we built a model like this, a, you know, a rigid body model here, roughly, with a few state variables, you know, x, y, theta, uh, elevator angle, the, we had vo velocity command of the actuator, so we, so it's an odd number of, of state variables because of that, okay, because um, we're commanding velocity instead of torque. And then the aerodynamics, we either used just the textbook flat plate model or the slightly higher fidelity one, which was basically the textbook flat plate plus some radio basis functions to cover the, the differences, and those did help. Uh, plane aerodynamics, we had to model the actuator delays and a couple other artifacts like that that are hidden in the model. But they all fit in this x stat equals f of x u. Uh, yeah? But doesn't that have like a few less variables than you might expect in a previous system? Hmm. We did a lot of things to try to make it 2D. So um, in particular, actually all you have to really do is um, give it a little bit of, of uh, dihedral, and then it's passively stable in, in uh, out of plane. Yeah, good question. Okay, so um, here's the picture. Uh, we, we actually built the wind tunnel just to take this picture, so uh, that was a lot of work. But it verified, and we, you know, we put smoke via titanium tetrachloride on the leading edge of the, of the wing, fired this thing off, took pictures, watched the vortices roll off, and in fact, they confirmed that those oscillations we were seeing um, satisfied that. I think the video didn't play. There it is. Okay, That's, here's the airplane, high speed motion slowed down about 11 times, it goes up to a very high angle of attack, um, and then that's a string that it knows where it is, and it basically, the airplane can land on a perch. Um, in order to do that in a motion capture room that's only 30 feet across, we had to build a slingshot basically to fire the um, thing and so it would leave the, the launcher at about seven meters per second and it would take about 0.8 seconds to go to approximately zero meters per second at the, at the um, you know, at the string. 
That was just trajectory optimization on the model plus LQR stabilization. Okay, so, and in the end, very robust. Now there's actually more going on to this. This is um, a family of projections that were all stabilized. This is, uh, this is another LQR trees thing that we'll talk about when we get to it. So this is now so a family of trajectories, each of them stabilized with LQR, and then we did some disturbs to understand the regions of attraction of those trajectories. And then he would fill the space with those trajectories. And in fact, it's, this thing, even though it had only a single control, almost always got it. And no, no, he, I mean, it, was, it was like 93% of the yeah. So if I threw it, it would be less because, you know, so the failure modes are if you don't put enough energy in, it'll not make it to the perch, or if you put too much energy in, it can't bleed it enough and it'll go over the top. Um, you know, Joe was a practiced uh, arm by the end, I'm sure. The feedback mattered, okay? So this is just executing the trajectory without the feedback stabilization and with the feedback stabilization. And I, if you remember, I told you before, when I was talking about LQR before, um, it was, you know, I, I had this vision initially of linear control being trying to squish the nonlinear dynamics. But this changed my mind because I watched that airplane, even with a single trajectory stabilized with LQR, if it had too much energy, it would actually dive down come up early and bleed out more energy in order to, to land on the perch. If it had too much energy, it would, it would do other, you know, it would do very non-trivial things to stabilize that trajectory, right? This, just like the pendulum that was locally good, you know, the linearization was pretty good for a while. The same thing, this time varying linearization is pretty good in the vicinity of the trajectory, right? And now, the reason you would put in your LQR formulation one of the rules of this, having Q be non-zero here, is to keep you close to the trajectory, to incentivize the feedback to keep you near the, traje the trajectory where your linearization stays good. But with that, all that stuff working, it can really do wonders. Okay, and then you know what we'll talk about more is is taking the Lyapunov type tools and understanding how to now make a time varying region of a time varying Lyapunov function, which says figures out the initial conditions where that controller is going to work, and you can imagine then we try to fill the space with those. Yeah. What sort of balance do you have on the feedback? Yeah, it was, so um, things got a lot better when we realized, again, this was like the early days of motion capture, but there was a, an option hidden in the menu of, of the um, motion capture, which was designed for human motion capture, right? And the option was wait 50 milliseconds before sending signals so that it's easier to watch. You know, like, so you can like, look over there, look over here, or something, you know. So we wasted a lot of time with a lot of delay. It was still, um, you know, it was still bad. Our, our loop time total was, was 50 to 100 milliseconds still by the end. There are newer motion capture systems that have much lower latency. We invested in some that were you know, under 10 uh, more recently. But back then it was, it was um, and there was actuator limits too. The, the rates of, the, um, of the, the servos that we were using at the time were pretty constraining. Yeah? Um, did you ignore the lag in your controller or did you do something to account for it? We made a first order approximation into the dynamics. Um, but then delay is sort of a funny thing. So um, pure delay, so the time it gets you is, is the difference between your measurement and your control action. And we basically accounted for that by putting an actuator model in that says my actuator takes time to execute with a continuous time approximation of those. Yeah. What was your wireless transmitter? Uh, it was a buddy box, right? So we had a USB from the desktop to, to a USB radio over the standard radio transmitter um, in buddy box mode, right? So standard RC, whatever the frequency was, yeah. Okay, and the quad rotor example, you know, this is just direct co-location applied to a system with obstacles that it works pretty well, okay? So um, it gets lucky, right? So, so I started it, I initialized this with a straight line, kind of going straight through the forest towards the goal. And the optimizer was able to snake it around, snake it around, and the quadrotor had enough control authority to bank enough to, to make those um, 
you know, make those turns. I could easily have cut up, come up with a different set of, of trees there that it started thinking it was going to go right, and then there was no path through the forest to the right, and it would have gotten stuck. But I put this in at the end because it is actually surprising. So for instance, you know, Tomas Lozano Perez is one of my favorite guys, and, and, and he was sort of, I, when we started doing this, he's like, hey, it couldn't, trajectory optimization couldn't possibly solve those problems, right? And, you know, sometimes it does. And, and, and actually, uh, more often than you, you, you know, you can't debug it when it doesn't. That's the annoying thing. But, you know, those times when it does work, it works really well. And it gives you nice, smooth trajectories out super fast. Um, it's a really powerful tool to have in your arsenal. Yeah? Does this require knowing the exact locations of the entire forest? In this example, it did, and then you know, and Pete's work, for instance, has talked about how do you do that with local sensing and, and the like, and how do you come up with a library so you can execute it with runtime information. There's been a lot of follow-on work, but this is just a simple example of of, of the trajectory optimization. Good question. Okay, cool. So. Um, We'll see you on Tuesday in this room for the midterm. I'm sorry that we lost a couple lectures before that. Hopefully you've been seeing all the materials and, um, online. I know you got the problem said that got shifted too. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. And there's extra office hours tonight. Extra office hours in the, no in the normal room, yep. Somewhere in the